All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our symposium on the pros and cons of a data-driven world. This symposium is the first time uh, that uh, Studium Generale and the Tilburg Young Academy collaborate on uh, organizing an event. Studium Generale, you probably know, organizing events around societally relevant topics, discussions on campus in the city. Tilburg Young Academy is a group of relatively young, uh, relatively young academics, <laughs> assistant professors, associate professors, uh, for some of you, maybe your teachers, who try to make this university a nicer place. And we do so, uh, for instance, by organizing discussions on interesting, relevant topics like dataism, uh, the pros and cons of a data-driven world. I've been asked to share with you one practical um, piece of information, which is that if you're interested in receiving a certificate from Studium Generale, you can join five different events, write a short reflection on this, uh, and then, you'll then you will receive one. This might be interesting for students, but maybe also for full professors who would like to add a very nice line to their, to their CVs. We'll work on this. <laughs> so why are we having this uh, event tonight? What's the rationale? What's the background behind it? Right, there we go. Um, one thing we've been noticing over the past 10 years or so is that some things are changing, seem to be changing within, within our society. If you switch on your TV, for instance, when I switch on my TV, I did this, uh, well, uh, for instance, about a year ago. I had a tough day. Uh, <laughs> this was also immediately the last time I did this. I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I noticed that when I was moving from channel to channel, there seemed to be a lot of competition going on. For instance, singing was presented as a competition. I wasn't really interested in looking at singing as a competition, so I switched to another channel. There was a program on dancing. I thought, nice, a program on dancing. But again, it was sort of presented in this form of a competition. Who's the best dancer? Who's the best singer? Which is kind of weird, right? Because singing and dancing are not necessarily like Olympic sports that you expect a competition to be uh, shown to you in. Another example that's even more bizarre, I think, is uh, playing with Lego blocks. And this is now presented in the form of a competition on TV. But why is playing with Lego uh, a competition? And finally, even baking cakes. And even more specifically, baking cakes by kids is now a competition. Those kids are baking cakes. Uh, they get a grade. There's a ranking. And the best kid or the best cake gets a prize. But since when did baking cakes in kids become a competition? Well, also, of course, universities love competition and rank. There's, there are all those competitions between universities. There are international rankings of universities. What university is doing best? Uh, what program is doing best? Tilburg University very much like those rankings. If you look at the web page, almost half of the web page is dedicated to rankings. Uh, for instance, we as Tilburg University are placed number 17 in the world in business administration. Congratulations to everybody in business administration. Uh, <laughs> But why should universities be ranked? Right, this, you could say, is part of this phenomenon of dataism. So the idea that maybe even everything uh, can be reduced to so-called objective data. Singing can be captured in data. Dancing can be captured in data. University performance can be captured in data. Social media, of course, uh, your post on uh, X or on Instagram is only successful if you have that many number of views, or likes, or shares. Of course, we all have those smartwatches now, right, that track uh, how many hours you slept during your night. If you want to know how well you slept during your night, you don't look into your mirror, but you look at your watch, and your watch tells you, well, you slept really well last night. <laughs> of course, scientists uh, just started uh, collecting data on everything, the number of citations your articles get when you publish. Uh, this is very junior research, as you will immediately recognize. And even individual scientific articles get metrics. How often did other scientists look at your article? How often did it get cited? How often was it shared on Twitter? Data, data, data. Uh, very informative, of course, if you're into those kind of things. But maybe also a little bit weird, right? All right, that's a bit of background to uh, this program this afternoon. Seems to be a lot of data being present, being collected, being analyzed in society. 
uh, as a sort of basis for all sorts of competitions. Is this a good thing or not? I'm very excited that we have an amazing lineup of speakers for you. Um, three full professors of whom two are vice deans, one used to be a vice dean. I think this is the most impressive lineup I have ever seen in my life in a scientific event. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, there will definitely be a ranking of the best presentation. Uh, <laughs> So the program is as follows. We'll have three relatively short talks for you, one per keynote speaker. Then we have an incredibly short break of only a couple of minutes, after which we'll have a final panel discussion with a couple of more people who are here, students, a program director, and our three keynote speakers. That's the program. So since we're already running late, I see, uh, without further ado, let me introduce to you the very first keynote speaker of today, which is Professor Esther Keimolen. Esther is well known for her work on the philosophy and ethics of technology. She's a full professor at the law school, and also she was the founding and very first uh, president of the Young Academy. So it's great to have you here, and we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you, David, for the introduction, and thank you for uh, uh, having me. I feel very honored to be here. And uh, first, let me tell you what the focus of my talk will be. So first, I would like um, to take a bit of a philosophical perspective and ask ourselves the question, why are we actually so eager to collect and use data? So what is so appealing on having all these data? So I want to first kind of look into that. And then secondly, I want to kind of switch towards the uh, technologies that we oftentimes use, David already listed some of them, smartphones, smart watches, all these technologies that we use in order to collect and, and oftentimes also analyze that data. Can I call you back, Ed? I'm in the moment here. Um, I don't know how it is for you guys, but um, I've been back from my holidays, I think, for two weeks now. and. It is very, very difficult to stay in the moment. We all try that, right? To kind of be in the here and now, don't think about um, oh, what uh, you have to eat for supper, or the problems that you have with your uh, boyfriend or girlfriend. So it's very difficult to stay focused and stay in the here and now. Uh, coaching and uh, influencers, they make a living out of uh, trying to help us to stay in the moment. But I would like to... Uh, put forward that we as human beings, we are not made to just live in the here and now. This is, depending on your take uh, of, on, on human life, we are cursed or blessed by the fact that we know that there is a future ahead of us and that we don't know for certain how this future will look like. Because if you think about it, there's actually a lot of uncertainty about that. So we as human beings, we have to deal with that uncertainty. We know there is a past ahead of us, we, uh, a past behind us and a future ahead of us. We are aware of this uncertainty in the future and we like to pretend as if we know that what will happen, but actually we don't. To make it even worse, that's my philosophical part of my identity, I always try to feel, uh, make people feel bad. <laughs> uh, we're also social beings. So it's not just that we have to deal with an uncertain future, we also have to deal with fickle others that have oftentimes a mind of their own. And uh, although we like to think that we know for certain what other people are thinking, we actually don't. But we live in, we are social beings, we still need to cooperate, to live together. So also there, there's quite some uncertainty that we have to deal with. If you think about all this uncertainty, you, you, you wouldn't be able to get out of bed if you don't have any strategies to deal with that uncertainty. So a lot of the things that we do are actually strategies to deal with an uncertain life. And meditating, agendas, regulation from the law school, uh, architecture, the way that this building is being organized kind of shapes and steers our interaction, and collecting data. Collecting data, uh, especially in, in our era uh, through data-driven <coughs> technologies, is also a strategy to get grip on a complex life. I mean, by collecting data, and we try to kind of, for instance, uh, through algorithms, try to see patterns, try to predict uh, what will happen in the future. 
um, right, through the smartphone, you try to kind of get a grip on your health. So data is a way that we human beings, a strategy that we use to deal with uncertainty, which is inherent uh, to human life, to being human. So that collecting data and turning it into meaningful information, I would say, is a key aspect of what it means to be human. And this, I believe, was beautifully presented by the German artist Raffaella Vogel, who had a temporary exhibition in our own Tilburg de Pont Museum um, recently. Unfortunately, you can't visit anymore, but you can still find some of the pieces online. And um, one of the installations that was in the de Pont Museum was called The Missed Education of Miss Vogel. And um, in the Missed Education, Vogel painted animal skin, uh, skins with a collection of knowledge diagrams. And with these, uh, she wonders how to represent information objectively. Together, they form more or less a kind of big mind map of the artist's knowledge and interests. So these range from Karl Marx to horse training and from jazz music to popular culture. So you can, as you can see, you can walk around and between the painted animal skins and they learn us, I think, important things about data and information. First of all, structure. In order for data to become meaningful, we have to structure it. So every painting or every animal skin is structured in a different way. And I think this immediately brings us to a very important second aspect of uh, data and how we use and, 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 and uh, transform data into information. Choice. Uh, so the, the, what we see on these animal skins is not a direct res representation of the information she has. Uh, she makes decisions on how to present it to the audience. So the choice of materials, animal skins in that sense, is both enabling and limiting. And there are things that you can do with these uh, uh, animal skill, skins and things that you cannot do. So whenever we use data, we make choices. And these choices are always incomplete in the sense that uh, the, the artist also doesn't pretend uh, to be complete, the missed education. This is not all her knowledge. She makes decisions on what to keep, what to include, what to exclude. She's also aware that she also doesn't know everything. There are inherent, there are inherently there are holes in our knowledge. There are also holes in uh, her installation, and you really get this feeling that um, uh, so this line of, of animal skin, so to say, it gives you the feeling if you walk there that it's, it could actually go on and on and on uh, until uh, forever. So what actually what I think what Rafaela Vogel shows is that um, and there's in, this inherent need of human beings to try to get grip on their lives through collecting, structuring and organizing data in a meaningful way. By doing that you, that, you always make choices, you include certain aspects, you exclude some, sometimes uh, information. And as a result, it's always incomplete. So when we take these characteristics of using data to make sense of ourselves, others, and the world around us. And uh, we put this in the context of our data-driven uh, era of algorithms, crunching data, smart devices, and proactive services. What if we do that? So if we take these character characteristics, characteristics with us, now what do we then see? So let's move from holes in knowledge to holes in the ground. Uh, so what am I talking about here? So this picture represents an app that citizens can download to indicate um, where the road surface was in need of repair. And uh, this is an, is an, it could have been in Tilburg, but this was in, in the US. And this led to the unexpected and undesirable situation that in some parts of the city, there was uh, a maintenance backlog. And the reason for that was that in certain parts of the city, there were fewer smartphones users and therefore fewer reports. So notwithstanding all good intentions, eh, trying to collect data on the uh, state of the road to have a 
proactive service um, and this data-driven intervention actually entrenches social inequalities uh, that are often already all too prevalent in our society uh, anyway. So this is also oftentimes referred to as representation bias. So that this arises when parts of the input space of the data are under of or over represented. Another example, in 2020 in uh, the UK, we are talking about Corona time, uh, there was a problem uh, of um, uh, the A level. So in the, in, the, in the UK, A levels are the exams that you usually take when you're around 18. And these are the last exams uh, before you go to the university. And they greatly influence, um, their outcome greatly influences which university a student can attend. So universities decide on uh, their offers. Uh, they, they decide that on considering the grades of the students um, uh, at their A, A levels. And oftentimes you need to kind of get a certain grade in order to go to your preferred university or, or program. So with COVID-19, there was no possibility of having these exams, so they thought like, okay, we do it with data, right? So they used an algorithm to predict what the final grade would be like, and they predominantly used two pieces of information, of, inf of data, the ranking of the students within a school and their school historical performance. And uh, they get the goal of the, the algorithm of the statistical model, it was not very uh, sophisticated, uh, was that the overall result should have been more or less the same as the previous year. So to make sure that there's not any strange things uh, with the outcome. But afterwards, data suggested that fee-paying private schools, independent schools in the UK, disproportionately benefited, benefited from this algorithm. These schools saw the, saw the number of A-level grades uh, increase by 4.7%, while uh, comprehensive schools, so public funded schools, uh, only saw an increase of less than half of that. So why is that? Because the algorithm placed so much importance on the school's historical performance, it was yeah, causing uh, more problems for high performing students in underperforming schools, so oftentimes public schools, where the individual's work would be lost, kind of lost in the statistics while average students at better schools, with a better historical track record, seem to have been uh, treated with more leniency. So the idea was that uh, we could capture everything in data, it turned out uh, to again uh, lead to uh, discrimination. So, trying to summarize um, what I um, want to put forward for this panel discussion is that we really kind of have to acknowledge that trying to capture the world in data really answers to this deeply felt need of human beings to deal with uncertainty. So I'm not in the sense, like if you have to kind of categorize people, I'm not against data-driven uh, applications or services because they do give us a lot of knowledge and insights in the future and we as reflexive human beings need, need help, need instruments to deal with this uncertainty. Uh, but the risk is that we blindly trust data. And this is something that we, I think, also within our university and as academics really have to uh, be careful uh, about, especially in the case of technologies. Uh, what we see is everything is you know, uh, hidden behind a beautiful interface, sleek designs, easy to use. Uh, we don't really see what's happening or understand what's happening behind it. And this is something what I'm worried about, that we too blindly trust uh, technology or data-driven technologies. Think back to what Raffaele Vogel showed this in this installation. We always, there are always choices being made. Who are making the choices? What is the, uh, the, the reasoning behind these choices? It's always incomplete. What has been left out? What are we not seeing? How has it been interpreted? Um, so we really have to be very, very critical when we're using data-driven uh, uh, technologies. And then I do think that they can have a beneficial and, and helpful um, um, function in our um, current lives. That was the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Esther. Very inspiring. Many questions already for the panel discussion after the break. Our second keynote speaker is Professor Raya Gerlach, Vice Dean of Research in Tysem, the School for Economics and Management, full professor in the economics department there, well known for his research on climate change, among other things, technology, empirical economics. It's great to have you here. We very much look forward to your insights. And sitting on the A12, that's what I'm most famous for. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> Take it away. Twice by now. Okay, my presentation is uh, complementary to uh, Esther's presentation. I'll talk about data in research and then with a the focus on uh, economics. And I can't help. I'm a researcher, I'm also a lecturer, and I just <coughs> love to tell people things that I hope you don't know. Uh, so afterwards, I hope, apart from data, we also have a better understanding of many more things. I myself, I'm quite, uh, I'm loving data, I'm quite quantitative in nature. So, uh, Tim Bergen, one famous uh, Dutch economist, no, winner of the Nobel Prize, uh, said, to measure is to know, weten is meten, meten is weten. So, what is that to know? To know is being able to predict what's going to happen in the future based on the data that you've got. So if you want to have a higher income in the Netherlands, many people, at least policymakers, want it. What should we do? We should improve schooling in the Netherlands. You can see that from data. If you want a cleaner world, what should we do? Does it help to have more environmental regulation in the Netherlands? Well, that's a difficult question. You need lots of data sort of to figure that one out. So we economists have always looked for how can data help us answer really important questions in research. And the point that uh, I'd like to uh, show you sort of is how, most of you are younger than me, uh, so when I started as a researcher, we typically worked with 100 data points, now we work with hundreds of millions or billions or whatever. Uh, so what happens? So that you sort of, at the back of your mind, you know what is, you now have all mobiles, but how did things go, how did it happen like what it's now? So, Typically, when I started, before the 90s, uh, we had data in the sense that we had some set of data like or whatever, and then we wanted to know does something relate to something else. So we set up a model, you don't need to worry too much about, let me see. So the point is typically we had, oh yes, thank you, that maybe. We typically had 100 observations. So uh, to think of an important question like, um, we wanted to know as economists why you, you observe that the rich countries always stay rich and the poor countries always stay poor. And we economists want to understand what's going on. Is there some colonial, you know, that we exploited poor countries and now they're poor forever? Or is there something else? So, and these kind of data could help us answer that kind of questions. So we built a nice model and here you see, this is the type of data we had at this time, you know, 100 observations. And using OLS, we could see things like, actually, uh, it's not that rich countries always stay rich. It is rich countries typically always invest more in education, invest more in capital, etc. And that's why they stay rich. And we could use this kind of simple data analysis for that. There's a problem, however, with causality, you know. Uh, does data tell you the truth? Well, data may, but statistics may not. So we want to establish that X that X causes Y, but it could be that there's something, some other thing set that actually is causing Y, set also causing X, and then, you know, you observe that X and Y are correlated, but actually it may have nothing to do with each other, it may all be down to set. So we were worried about these kind of things. Then, 10 years later, we started to have more data. So we started to collect data systematically and then for each country we would have, say, 20 years of observations rather than just one point. And we could see, look, if you see that schooling and income always goes up together or goes down together, then that is actually a much better sign that these two relate to each other than if they are just correlated between countries. So this was a huge improvement, able because of a big increase in data. So the increase in data allowed us to do better causality uh, tests. So this is a typical uh, example and now comes sort of the first potentially uh, uh, problematic uh, issue is that uh, in this point in time you could already publish anything anymore empirically unless you had this type of data available. So this was sort of the first version of dataism. Because if you would not have this uh, panel data, so data with many 
types of firms or countries over a long many years, they would say, well, we're not sure about causality, Mr. or Mrs. So then economists came with a nice idea, which is called instrument. It's really a big issue in economics. And the idea is, if we have some set that we know set only causes X, uh, and it does not cause Y directly, and we know that X may cause Y, and we observe that set actually is correlated with Y, then it must have gone through X. So um, the example here is, let me see whether I had the example there. Yeah, so that's the paper that I had. If you have corruption, and you have uh, reason to uh, argue that corruption actually translates into poor environmental quality, you have no reason to argue that corruption is really directly causing more polluting industry, but you do see that more corrupt countries tend to have more polluting industries, then you may argue it may be the environmental policy, the lax environmental policy that actually causes an increase in the polluting industry. Now then we got, so that led us to Datism 2. At some point in time, you almost can't publish anymore any uh, empirical analysis if you don't have this beautiful instrument structure. Now, we move on further, 10 years later, and it really gets out of hands. So now we don't work with 1,000 data points or so. We have very large data sets because we have thousands of households. Uh, we have, I'm working now with electricity prices for every hour, for every region in Europe for many years. And then within every hour, there are bids by many firms for many prices. So we're talking about billions of data. Now, what happens in a certain way if you want nowadays in economics to publish empirical research? You almost have to show that you have some very big data set and that you have some very smart process to get the information out of the data. If you don't do that, then the referees will say, well, we're not sure whether this really is value added. Now, is this a problem or not? Um, so the, the empirical observation that I see is that handling very big data has become a token of, of capacity quality of the study. Now, um, what it means in a certain way Economists know that signaling. I signal I'm a good researcher by doing some heavy data stuff. And um, well, um, the advantage is that possibly if smart researchers actually are the ones who can work with big data, then the signaling works quite well. So then we have a nice signaling system that says, well, these guys sort of have a better understanding of the world. Uh, they are allowed to publish, and the other, well, they don't understand so much. They are not able to do these nice features with big data. So let, let's, let's not allow them to publish. Whether this works or not is important because there are so many really difficult questions that we have to answer. So smoking, causing, smoking causes cancer. Too much eating causes diabetes. These are questions that really we are now addressing this today with very big data. Huh? Uh, you have to figure out, so here we are convinced, here there are all kinds of different reasons that may, may be di diabetes, that there's reverse causality, etc. So, um, the end. Um, my, I myself, I tend, because, you know, you're this personal prejudice, I'm good with data, so I tend to think that it's in a certain way okay, <laughs> you know, because it favors my type, let's be honest about that. So, um, but um, if we believe that sort of the correlate, there's not really a correlation between understanding big data and understanding deep fundamental sort of structure of problems, then we have a problem in research in the sense of this type of dataism entering our empirical work. So, um, I think I was right with on time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, very interesting. We are nicely on schedule, that's great. So I can introduce our third keynote speaker to you, Professor Philippe Joos, Accountancy Department of this uh, university. Also former Vice Dean of Education, so he will also partially talk about uh, dataism in the context of education. Please, the floor is yours.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, the problem as a, a third speaker is that uh, many points I wanted to make are already said by the first two speakers, but uh, I'll say something anyway. Okay, so. <laughs> um, so uh, well, you introduced me also as a former vice dean education, so I'll say something about um, education as well, but I know we will have interesting panel um, questions about this, so I'll keep most of the discussion for, for the panel. Uh, so I'll focus most of my talk on part one, which is more digital innovation in, uh, in our society and yeah, uh, the, the dangers and, and the, the prospects, but I'll focus especially on innovation and I'll give you some uh, better view on uh, what's going on there. But I'll start with um, some history. I like history, reading history books and so on, and um, maybe some of you uh, know who this person is, Alan Turing. Yeah, so I see some people nodding. Um, did you see, uh, by any chance, the, the movie The Imitation Game? Yeah, okay, so it's a, I think it's a very good movie. I mean, that's my uh, personal uh, opinion. And um, so if you've seen the movie, you know that this person was quite instrumental with um, decoding the Enigma machine that the Germans used to code all the instructions they gave um, over sea, over land, and so on, uh, to position their troops and, and, and doing all that kind of stuff. So he was able to figure this out, uh, how to decode the Enigma machine. And by doing so, he discovered basically a tool that later on became like a computer, yeah? so digitizing everything. And um, in 1950, he wrote uh, a very controversial paper, um, and this was referring to the imitation game, so the movie title is actually uh, also what uh, the paper is about, kind of thinking about, and he's a visionary in that sense, uh, uh, it's called the Turing test. Uh, so when uh, can we actually really talk about a machine that has it intelligence, like artificial intelligence? So he was the first one kind of talking about artificial intelligence, 1950, okay? So uh, now we are more than 70 years later, and now everybody is talking about chat, GPT, and so on. But he already kind of wrote about all these uh, things, and many people thought he was completely mad, okay? So that's... Uh, um, and then he even devised a test uh, to figure out whether a machine is intelligent or not. Yeah? So you put a person in the room, the evaluator, you have two other rooms, one with a human being and one with a machine. You ask a question through uh, writing and then you get uh, an answer back and the answer would reveal to the evaluator, the human being, whether yeah, uh, the answer is coming from a machine or uh, from a human being. And he said, uh, whenever the evaluator is kind of clueless, then you are dealing with an intelligent machine, and this is what we call artificial intelligence. Yeah? And he talked about all the types of questions you can ask and so on, but he was definitely visionary in what we're currently experiencing today. Yeah? Um, so talking about artificial intelligence, it's not a new thing. That's my message here. Um, it's not <laughs> working anyway. Okay. Uh, okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So now uh, many things have uh, been said already, so I'll quickly go through this. Uh, the fact that our society is changing rapidly with uh, digital innovation is pretty uh, obvious. Okay, knowledge is definitely freely available everywhere. Uh, you say something and people immediately uh, Google something and, and see whether you're right or wrong and so on. Um, so given that it's freely available, universities in itself are not kind of their prim primary task is not only to uh, transfer knowledge, but also to kind of uh, transfer a skill set. Okay? So you need to have skills like creativity and critical thinking uh, that is actually quite important uh, in, in a world where yeah, knowledge is almost freely available. Yeah. Uh, but you also have, and that's sometimes the scary part, and I'll show you why it's scary, especially for me. Um, okay, so you have to wait. Huh? So you... Okay. Well, okay, let's... Okay, well, I'll use the arrows. Um, so <clears throat> uh, some people at Oxford... Um, 
almost 10 years ago, published a paper, The Future of Employment. It's a little bit outdated, but uh, what you see is the probability, the top uh, professions there, is the probability that these uh, jobs will be lost in 10 years. So now we can actually evaluate, it's almost 10 years since that was published, uh, an accountant, uh, I'm an accounting professor, okay, so I'm dealing sometimes with real accountants, uh, I'm an academic, yeah, so the, uh, and accountants are still around, yeah? so accountants are still around, auditors are still around, I mean, they are even expanding, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see, and they found new ways of making themselves useful. But the job itself is actually changing very much. The job they had 10 years ago is very different actually from the job uh, they have right now. And that's what I will illustrate with uh, some examples later on as well. And you can actually say this for some other of these categories. So in a sense, the job itself, accountant, is still around, but it's different from 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, telemarketers, yeah, maybe that's... Uh, uh, changing, um, so yeah, universities definitely need to think about uh, education in terms of uh, preparing someone for a job because the jobs are changing anyway, okay? So you need to have a skill set and, and these types of things. So um, <clears throat> again, uh, for a student, uh, digitalization is definitely affecting students. Blended lives, I mean, it's pretty obvious that uh, when I look at my own kids, uh, uh, sometimes my daughter is kind of saying, ah, okay, this is for my be real, and uh, suddenly I need to be out of uh, her sight or whatever, uh, uh, <laughs> because that would uh, spoil the whole uh, be real. Um, and, and this is the, the way of life, okay? So you have a digital life, and you have uh, a real life, okay? So in, uh, in the room. Uh, and Esther was already referring to this too. Uh, and uh, a very important thing is the demand for freedom and choice, okay? And apparently the digital world is offering much more freedom and choice. I mean, apparently, okay. Um, now, many applications uh, where you actually see this is that um, fields like healthcare, uh, mobility, consumption, trade, even warfare. I mean, we are confronted with uh, this terrible war in Ukraine and Sometimes I have the impression this is a computer game. You know? they, they shoot rockets, it's, it's all digital, they have satellite images, so it's very dehumanized, although the <laughs> effects are affecting yeah, uh, real humans. Okay. Um, financial decision making, I'm, a lot of my research is involved with uh, financial decision making, and there you see that uh, digitalization has a huge impact on the professions, but also the way we make uh, financial decisions. Uh, Think alone, uh, your experience, uh, how you interact with the bank, yeah? how you make, uh, yeah, how you pay, but also how you make investment decisions yourself. It's very different from uh, 10, 15 years ago, yeah? where you have personal advisors and these types of things, whereas now, I mean, it's, it's very different. Now, <clears throat> given all these changes, the question is, how do organizations deal with these changes? And, Let's start, I mean, we are at a university. How is a university dealing with all these changes in society due to these, uh, uh, this digitalization? Um, and one very interesting economist, also from the same time as uh, Alan Turing, but he lived a little bit longer, uh, is uh, Josef Schumpeter, who basically introduced this whole notion of organizations that uh, do not have this capability of ambidexterity, uh, using your left and your right hand, will disappear, okay? So they, they will disappear. And the challenge is, how do you manage these, the left hand and the right hand? And the left hand is basically, you always need to explore new possibilities, okay? So that's a way of innovating, like you, you experiment, you, you, uh, you try to discover new things and so on, and you put some resources that you have, some money that you have into these experiments. And some, many of these experiments fail. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, that's one thing. Now, we are a university, we have more than 20,000 students, you cannot constantly experiment with 20,000 students. So what you need to do is you need to have a very smooth process, you need to have a very good uh, learning management system, Canvas, 
Uh, and you need to have uh, these improvements, innovations, that make things even more efficient, okay? Uh, you have new technologies, better cameras, and so on and so on, to make online learning uh, for everybody more accessible. This is exactly the other type of innovation, yeah? And the question is, how do companies make the choice? And I was very privileged uh, uh, to be chosen by the, one of the former rectors uh, to be part of this uh, whole program that was called DEEP, okay, the, the Digital Education Enhancement Program. Yeah? And I had a task force, and we had to think about how to organize educational innovation at our university, uh, given our new profile that we had. And, and, and there I was immediately confronted, actually, with all these problems that Josef Schumpeter was saying. Because the first thing I noticed was, yeah, but you are asking for a lot of budget for experiments. And yeah, what's the result of an experiment? I said, well, if you don't do it, uh, you won't notice it the first year, but at some point, uh, you will be outdated. Yeah? Corona happened after I was uh, vice dean, and suddenly the university thought, wow, we need to invest in digital equipment, digital things without any experiments. And this is why many experiences that you may have had were not optimal because we didn't actually invest a lot in these exploring these possibilities before Corona. Yeah. So, um, but I, I want to use another example. I'm an accounting professor, so I read, uh, I'm not only looking at um, interesting movies like The Imitation Game, but I read financial reports of companies. This is really poetry, okay? So believe me, I mean, once you actually get into it, uh, I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, and one of these, uh, it's telling a story about a company, what they want to do, how they want to change the world. And BMW is something that's caught my attention, okay? Now, last week, the Neue Klasse was introduced and so on uh, in the news and this and that, but that was already two years ago in their financial statement. So I already knew this. Uh, but, yeah, th this is why financial statements are, are quite useful. And what you actually currently see, this is from March uh, uh, of this year, is that they, uh, on their front page, they kind of try to say that uh, the future of BMW, which is an old company, depends not only on their way of how to, they want to, how they see mobility, but, and of course, electrification, that's a new type of, mechanics that they use, but digitalization is crucial, and their sustainability is part of uh, their strategy as well. So then you say, ah, wow, they, they are kind of showing nice pictures and so on about digitalization, and they have nice uh, yeah, features that they will introduce. The new car will have avatars, you know, so that you approach the car and suddenly you see an avatar. Uh, that, that's what they will introduce, and apparently that's giving you a special experience. Um, but then uh, you basically look at what they see as the key performance indicators. Like how will they, uh, what do they strive for, and where are they investing their money in? And of course, one of the performance indicators is, well, we need to be profitable. Okay, so profits are on the top. And then they kind of use data, so again, it's data, it's really uh, what what's, uh, we've seen with uh, Esther's last slide. The key performance indicators are really from a very complex production company going to well, the, the essence of what they actually see as key data where they steer the company in, in a certain future direction. And they say it's all about electric cars and reduction of uh, CO2 emissions which is fine, okay, they, they even put some targets there. And then the question is, how do you actually measure it? Now, and Reijer knows all about this, many of the emissions are basically, uh, yeah, uh, an emission that is not part of the production, but part of the use of the car afterwards. It's also part of the supply chain. If you have batteries being produced in China, where they use a lot of coal, I mean, that's not very good. <coughs> How do you actually measure this? And this is the big measurement issue that eventually needs to boil down in whether they reach these targets, yes or no. And that's the huge challenge uh, of, of getting data. So you need to have an enormous amount of data to actually do this. 
And then you need to have accountants. I'm back to, uh, it's the promotion talk for, for accounting, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and then you need to have people verifying whether these data are indeed correct, yeah? because otherwise you are, you are cheating. It's greenwashing. It's uh, uh, fictitious data that, that shows that you reached uh, the target. So it, it's a huge challenge. Yeah? And um, yeah, that's, uh, now I show this car. And what you see here, maybe some of you have seen this. Uh, if you go to San Francisco, I was there last summer, like a few months ago, uh, you may actually see this, this uh, thing there. So the, the Waymo taxi. Yeah. Anyone? Can you raise hands? Yeah, OK. So you, you've seen one. OK. Um, so I was spending some time in Silicon Valley last summer. And even I, I didn't realize, but I went for a run in the morning. And suddenly, I saw these uh, fully automated cars without the driver driving around us. And, and I was apparently in the test area of Stanford University. So, uh, so it was full of, so I was the guinea pig, I guess. <laughs> Do they see me or not? Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, there was a very interesting story about this. Uh, it's very data driven, OK, because you need to have lots of sensors uh, doing this. This is the future. Yeah? Um, uh, fully automated cars without uh, a driver. Um, but there, there was an accident. A, a fire truck hit one of these taxis with a passenger inside, without a driver, of course. Uh, and apparently, the, uh, the car was not programmed to understand uh, the, the noise made by the um, uh, fire truck. So the fire truck basically hit this car because it didn't stop. It, it simply continued uh, right at the crossing, and uh, the person was severely injured, and, and so on and so on. So again, a uh, little programming error. Um, but so, so I mean, th this uh, requires a lot of data. And hopefully, there are some improvements. But there are many challenges ahead, apart from, uh, and I'll summarize these challenges. What I'm actually getting at. Uh, I didn't show uh, a taxi uh, that was uh, run by BMW. I showed a taxi that was run by Waymo, which is a company owned by Google. Alphabet is the uh, parent company. And if you look at the largest companies in the world, okay, these are the 10 largest companies as of yesterday in terms of market cap, like the... the the stock price times the number of shares being traded somewhere in the world. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, huge uh, success in last year. Uh, Tesla, to a certain extent, and then uh, Meta platforms. It's all tech companies. It's all platform type of companies. They seem to have yeah, the biggest um, future expectations of yeah, uh, value uh, that they can create. And then you see some Berkshire Hathaway. OK, well, that, that, that's an investment company. And then a pharmaceutical company. And well, the Saudis, yeah, they have lots of money anyway. So <laughs> they, that, that's an oil company. But that's very different from, let's say, 40 years ago, because uh, that would be steel companies and other types of companies. So tech companies are massive, are huge. And this is why Google is way further ahead, actually, than BMW. So going back to Schumpeter, is BMW uh, yeah, safe for the next 10 years? I don't think so. Okay? So m maybe they are in their Kodak moment. Uh, Kodak also believed that uh, the, the film role would stay forever. And yeah, in five years, they were bankrupt okay? because of digital cameras. So. Um, <clears throat> Now, is there a problem? And uh, th this is a little bit for discussion here. Given this, this ambidexterity and these companies changing and the digital expectations of customers and these types of things, uh, it could lead to huge reductions of employees. Yeah? Uh, because you don't need all these engineers in BMW anymore. Uh, because most the cars are basically sensors and uh, data driven so you need to have programmers not these mechanical engineers anymore uh, and that, that's a little bit the problem that the German car manufacturers or, or the traditional car manufacturers actually have they have many people employed that are not very useful in these 
new cars, uh, fully connected cars. Uh, now, Eric Brilliofson is a Stanford University uh, economist. He's saying, look, uh, it's not a gloomy picture. When internet appeared in the 90s, it's not that uh, everybody got unemployed, okay? So uh, what will change is what I said before, you will actually have a different type of job, okay? So you, you will need to use technology differently. And he gives this very interesting example of a radiologist. And you go to the hospital to the radio, radiologist. And basically, they discovered that computers and artificial intelligence is way better, actually, in uh, screening uh, everything that needs to be screened, um, analyzing all these images, than a human being. So that part of the job, of the 36 tasks that a radiologist does, should be left to artificial intelligence. And then uh, the person should specialize in something else, yeah, which is sedating people, consulting patients, and these types of things. So uh, the jobs will be different. Yeah? Uh, now, going back to my previous slides, uh, what worries me a lot is actually the power that these huge companies have, like the Googles, the, the Facebooks, and so on. Uh, and I'm not against uh, capital markets, by the way, so definitely not. But, uh, I mean, there, there are some uh, things like, first of all, inflation. Uh, if they have market power, yeah, you know that uh, they, they can set prices. Um, legal protection of consumers may be an issue, yeah, and that's the, the battle uh, that, that we currently see. Product safety, yeah, they, they try to get you addicted to their products. Yeah, so uh, people, and the Be Real is quite addictive, TikTok and so on. So before you know it, you spend four days, uh, four hours per day on social media, wasting your time uh, to a large extent, but that's by design. Um, and what's even worse is that they try to kill innovation if they don't come up with the innovation themselves. So the killer acquisitions, uh, taking over a company and basically killing it, yeah? so that's, uh, or bundling products. Uh, you, you can only use the product if it's part of a bundle. Um, patent battles, you start, you have a great legal team, so you can never win actually from Google, okay? So that's the, um, now, uh, it was actually in Financial Times uh, a few days ago. Uh, we'll see. Next week, uh, the big Google process will start. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission will actually uh, well, try to, to uh, stop uh, the market power of Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. So that's interesting to see. And we've seen this before, okay? So uh, more than 100 years ago, we had the big oil running everything, and the biggest person, now we talk about uh, Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk and so on, but then it was, uh, Rockefeller, and Rockefeller was completely dominating the, the world uh, oil business. And then there was also a trial in 1906 or 1908, and then they broke up the company, and suddenly you saw lots of innovation going on in, in the industry. So uh, definitely this is a, a call for action, uh, legal action, and so maybe I should look at Esther actually for the legal part. Uh, uh, what I also see, with this whole digital thing that I, I showed is increased inequality. Increased in inequality because the jobs are changing. And the educated people, education becomes much more important. And it's a little bit story of the potholes that, that you had. Uh, if you have a, a smartphone, you can actually uh, act. If you don't have the education, if you don't have a good system, uh, education system where you have social mobility, then it will be terrible. And this was the shock I had. I lived for 10 years in the United States, and I'm really kind of shocked whenever I look at this country how the social inequality will even be bigger because of this whole uh, digital innovation and the type of jobs that will be produced because you need to have to be educated in the skills that you need to, to develop these uh, digital tools and, and, and more. Uh, and then the other frightening thing sometimes is uh, dehumanizing these transactions, okay? So um, you get advice from people, uh, but you have biases. Uh, you gave excellent examples. Uh, Cybercrime is one of the biggest investments these days yeah? uh, because once you actually have 
um, yeah, uh, depend on uh, digital uh, technology. Um, yeah, cybercrime is there. So connected cars, uh, the biggest fear is that someone takes over in Russia and you don't <laughs> drive your car, but um, yeah, you drive to another destination. <laughs> and then interactions. Um, I also fear, and especially for the younger generation uh, who grew up in this whole digital uh, environment, that um, yeah, communication skills are an issue. Yeah. And we, we've seen this at the university, like the, the, the effect of COVID, where people stayed home, where they were fully connected digitally, had a huge impact on, on the generation, on, on the young generation. Well, I have kids like 25 and 22, and uh, also they are definitely affected actually by, by the disconnection and, and their skills, their communication skills and building trust and so on. So they, they behave differently. Yeah. So I want to basically, I had some slides here, but uh, I'll keep it actually for the discussion. Okay, because my time is up. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought once again. Three very complementary presentations, I think. That's a great basis for discussion. Uh, the final part of our program today will be a panel discussion. Okay, welcome back, everybody, or welcome still here. Uh, my name is Inge van der Ven. I'm also a member of the Tilburg Young Academy and an assistant professor of uh, the Department of Culture Studies. And I'm going to lead this panel discussion with uh, some already familiar faces by now. But you also see, to my left side here, three uh, new faces. And I wanted to ask you maybe if you could briefly introduce yourself, starting with Judith, to my left. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Judith Kunneke. I'm also a part of the accounting department like Philip, and I'm also the academic director of that program, the Master of Accountancy, so I guess the promotion talk continues a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this is a one I'm big scheme. member of the Ta Tilburg Academy. Absolutely, Absolutely. yes. Don't forget. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Yes. Uh, I'm Elaine. Did you use the, the microphone? Oh. My name is Elaine. Uh, I uh, am doing a board year this year at the uh, Student Party Front, so I am here as a representative of one of the student parties in the University Council. And you know everything about facilities? I oh think. yeah, my uh, function this year is uh, General Director of Facilities, so uh, I am concerned with all the facilities that the University has to offer. Uh, so you can think like the library, uh, sports facilities, food, catering, basically everything on campus, uh, but also digital things. Excellent, thank you. Well, uh, my name is Jeroen. I am the vice chairman and international officer of student party SAM. Uh, we're also a party in the university council, so we're here to yeah, represent the voice of the, uh, of the students and everyone involved. Oh, thank you so much. We're very happy to have you here. We also need the student representatives for uh, what is about to come. So uh, we prepared some of uh, actually about four statements for the panelists right now. And we're going to dive right into it because we don't have enough, uh, a lot of time. But later on, we really would like to hear your input as well. So let's just go with the first one. Strongly relying on quantitative data makes our society a better place. Well, maybe we can already know a little bit what you think about this, but maybe we start with Raya for this one. Uh, well, it's fairly simple. For a better place, you need better people. Uh, and uh, to make good decisions, you need knowledge, so you need data. But uh, so with more data, you can also have a very bad place if you have a bad dictator. So uh, it's an interaction between having good data and having a good person uh, who can use the data, or a good club of people who can use the data. So, um, well, I'm a, sorry, I'm a researcher. The, the, it's, it's the wrong statement. <laughs> Thank you for this very nuanced answer. It's a good opening statement on your behalf. Esther. Um, um, adding to that, so I, I um, um, the strongly is, is a, the, the, the word that I uh, have a bit of a problem uh, with. So what I also tried to say during my talk was that, yes, data-driven technologies uh, can definitely help us to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. But strongly, uh, to me, it sounds a bit uh, that we're not really critical about it, that we're blindly just relying on what this data is, is telling us. And that is something I think we should be very careful uh, about. 
Thank you. I really like this distinction that you made also before between trust or faith and then blind trust or blind faith. I think that's very helpful here. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so maybe you heard about um, what happened in uh, December 2019 when Ursula von der Leyen gave her maiden speech, uh, and it was on the, the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, and that's actually to make a better Europe, a better society, environmentally friendly, and so on. The key aspect here uh, to get to the Green Deal is data. Yeah? So uh, what happened, uh, the European Commission uh, a few weeks ago, <laughs> Um, approved the whole new set of rules to gather data from 50,000 larger organizations, uh, publicly listed firms, but also uh, non-listed firms, um, to measure the whole environmental social impact of these organizations based on a set of, uh, I don't know, 500 page set of rules uh, how to measure it, what it does, uh, and make it comparable. And that's what Reijer actually said. It's key to actually measure the progress, but it's also key to actually have verifiable data, because otherwise you have uh, the risk of greenwashing. And what we're currently seeing is that there is a huge extent of unverifi unverifiable data, because the, the, this whole set of rules is not applicable yet. It starts next year. And everybody is claiming certain things. Yes, we are green. BMW saying, yeah, we are doing great. But it's actually not true. Okay, So I think uh, I strongly believe that uh, we need to have uh, verifiable data. Yeah, 1,100 data points, by the way. That's what uh, the European Commission uh, is asking yeah. companies to report on. Okay. So yeah, I believe uh, strongly relying on it. Uh, what you already uh, said is that you don't have to need to trust it blindly. Um, it can put you in a position where you can learn way more, you can compare way more. Um, so yeah, there are more opportunities with data, but it's not necessarily about, well, yeah, it kind of depends on how much data. I mean, I guess more is better, um, but also how you use it. I think that's way more important. Um, so yeah, it's already uh, the people and the data is like a dynamic between it. So yeah, it's not necessarily data, but how do you use it? What is what makes uh, what makes if uh, if it makes a society a better place? Yeah, it depends on how you use it. Okay, but I'm hearing a lot of examples where the data is either incomplete or wrongly interpreted, or someone does something wrong with it. But you also have examples, maybe one of you, of where it's intrinsically not a really good idea to collect a lot of data. So are there downsides to data more? Essentially, if you know what I say, I think you, Esther was a little bit driving at it before with uh, this issue of control and wanting to know everything, and maybe there's limits to that. I don't know. The big companies collecting all data about us is intrinsically bad. I believe so. Yes. But those are the wrong actors, then. Yes. They use but that's the point. Yes. <laughs> so they collect data because they want simply to make more profits. And then the act of collecting data is in itself neutral. Not well, no, because once you've got the data, you're vulnerable. Okay. So it's intrinsically bad that Google, Amazon, Facebook, they all collect all the data about all of us. Intrinsically bad. We should forbid it. Okay. Very strong. I'm going to go over to the next one and then start at this side, because if we all answer the question, then I'm afraid we'll run out of time. And now, oh, now it's doing for me, it's doing the same. Oh, I have to be patient. Uh, no, not, not that one. Let's skip that. Oh, jeez. Okay, so we're going to give it a little bit of a different direction because I feel that this uh, particular topic <laughs> hasn't uh, been addressed as of yet. And uh, because there's lots of students here, I really want to know uh, what you think about this as well because it's definitely an aspect of, of data collection that we should be talking about. So the issue is, uh, the statement is, quantitative student evaluations of teaching are a good thing, very simply put. And I'm going to start with Judith for this one. Yeah, because I'm reading a lot of those as, as the director of the program. But I think before you can answer the statement, you actually have to ask yourself another question. And the question is, and, and bear with me for a second, what puts a student into the position to assess how good a teacher is? For example, if you think our education is a ser uh, like a service and you are our customers, maybe that would be the case. But we are not offering services. In the best case, how we would define our students is, you are our 
proud product, you know. We yeah, sorry, it's, it's a, I think it's the best description that we help you to develop, to develop your skills. The customer is the labor market and society. And they can say whether we did a good job because you eventually fill the positions, you are employed, you help companies to grow and to make at least a little bit of profit, that's fine. <laughs> um, and then a second version or another thought is like, our teachers, they go to a lot of education, training, we acquire qualifications to give education, to provide sessions. Now, if I would say, if students have sort of the same went through there, you're more than welcome to assess, even on a quantitative scale, how good we are. Having said this, I still want to add here, that doesn't mean that we don't value the input. But as when I'm looking at these evaluations, yes, Quantitative measures, they catch my attention, but what I immediately do is I go and read the comments. And this goes back to, it's not only quantitative. We need to have the explanation. It's a starting point for us to investigate and then ask our um, sounding boards and the education committee, so but what is it exactly that was sort of bugging you during the course? And I can then pick up on this and make it better for the yeah, next cohort of students. But purely, relying on this quantitative measure because, to be honest, it's laziness. We send out 20,000 evaluations, it's easy to get back numbers, but it doesn't tell you everything. So it's not all, and, and we should always accompany it with, yeah, with narratives, I would say. Okay. Um, as a student, uh, we uh, took the liberty to collect our own data to answer this question uh, recently. <laughs> We let uh, students answer uh, what they thought of uh, these kind of student evaluations. Um, first, I wanted to add that um, just purely quantitative evaluations we don't think uh, are a very good thing. I don't think you can really get a lot from it. Uh, just because just based on numbers and based on grades, you don't know what you have to improve and what cause the grade, so you don't know where the uh, yeah, weaknesses and where the strengths are. So I always think you need to have that further explanation, what you said, uh, about how you grade someone and how you evaluate someone, because otherwise you don't really learn anything from it. We think, um, then to the laziness of the students, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in general, students don't really enjoy filling out all those evaluations, um, but that comes more of a place of that they don't benefit from it because they've already finished the course and they doubt a little bit what kind of effect it actually has because you can't really see for yourself if it's better next year unless you fill the class and you're taking it again. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you don't necessarily always see a big difference. Um, and when they fill out these kinds of evaluations, usually just the bad things come out and not the good things. Because otherwise students don't feel like they have to fill it out because they're like, okay, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. So why would they benefit from my uh, evaluation? Oh. And that's uh, basically the input we gathered from some students at the university. Well, thank you, Elaine. I think we all can learn a lot from this uh, perspective. May I, may I add something? Of course. So, um, uh, I also teach at, at YATS in, in the BOS, the data science uh, uh, program. And there I think they have an interesting kind of um, uh, practice when it comes to quantitative uh, evaluation. They're, they also have quantitative ev evaluations and also open space where you can, as a student, put in comments. And um, so they ask the, 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 the course coordinators to reflect on the uh, evaluations and then they also put it on Canvas for the next year. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So you get more of a kind of conversation of course, not with the students that fill out the, 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 the student evaluation, but it's kind of over generations, uh, you try to improve uh, the, the, the education. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a nice way of making it more contextualized and, and not just that it, ma that it makes a difference, right? So that I, I like that. Does it have to do with accountability as well? That you are held accountable for what you did last year and you can show students like, look, I already improved. <laughs> 
I'm getting better. Yeah, but also sometimes um, uh, course coordinator lecturers said like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but a bit what you were saying like, you think it's not important that I teach you this now, mm -hmm. but I know it is important, so I'm going to keep teaching it, even if you don't like it. See, we know better. Yeah. 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 And I think that's also good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's good. Another point that we, we might want to work in there somewhere is, I think uh, David at the beginning uh, touched upon it, is that uh, some of these uh, data collections are also a little bit biased. So there are instances in which people also get confronted, especially in the uh, qualitative part, with uh, racist uh, comments or sexist comments. And I'm sure none of you have ever done this. But, uh, or, or not very nice comments. And I think this, this emotional level can, we can also bring into the discussion, but because we are also humans. Yeah, so I, I think they could be extremely useful, but they currently are not, and lecturers are complaining on, a, complaining on a large scale, and we know we have data that indeed there's bias against women, not only racist, also about gender. We also know that um, if you give a, uh, a chocolate, you can increase your if overall evaluation score, that kind of stuff. Remember that. Uh, <laughs> so there are all kind of weird um, as uh, appears, uh, I think we should much better, uh, we should pay more attention as university. I think we should improve this. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's actually what I wanted to say about the bias in the evaluation. If you only look at the quantitative measures, and again, it's going back what you say, we should get better. We should be less lazy and actually, for example, take our colleagues with us and say, look at my session and give me open feedback about how I was doing together with input from the students. Again, I didn't want to say that it's nothing, that it's not worth to get this input, but it needs the context also, as you said again, and that costs more time again. And I think this is hopefully where we are also going a little bit. And I, I do can assure you that we do something with the feedback. I understand that this is a little bit, sometimes, yeah, sure, of course they talk. No, we do. <laughs> okay. well, maybe I can say something about what we do with uh, the feedback. Uh, so. For quite a number of years, I've been part of uh, one of the members of the Promotion and Tenure Committee, like uh, to promote and tenure faculty members uh, uh, at our school. And um, of course, we look at research, we look at citizenship, and of course, education. And it's the, the cash cow of the university. 80% of our budget is actually from education, so it's, uh, it's quite important. And of course, we do look at time trends uh, over five years, uh, what a person has done. And an easy way to do this is to have the summary measures, uh, the, the, the numbers. Okay, so quantitative information is definitely helpful for us, but then we look at all the evaluations and comments, so we, we find out. But that's not enough, because we know they are happy sheets, they are time uh, moments. We really dislike uh, the very low response rates often, uh, which is really a problem, and then you run into the problem of uh, getting extremes. Yeah? So if you are, and, and then it, it's immediately putting the score down. Yeah? If you have a, a few ones out of five, then uh, it's not very good. But I want to actually stress here that uh, these are indications. So what we try to do is to get feedback from colleagues, what Judith actually said, so they need to get a certificate, a teaching certificate, where colleagues are in the room, where they have mentors, and we look at the report that these mentors write, how they, they structure courses, how they do things, all, all the, these types of things, and we ask the academic director, who is responsible for a program, to comment on all different types of uh, dimensions, including innovations, yeah? because what I said before, the EMBED dexterity, and we need to have teachers who basically not only do whatever they've been doing for 50 years, uh, for the last 50 years, but who innovate, who try to capture new things. So uh, again, the use is, is minimal out of the, the whole data set that we use, oh, data set is the wrong word, but uh, information set that we use in the Promotion and Tenure Committee. Yes, um, some, uh, something I also forgot to say. Um, we also got some feedback from students that they say if you do course evaluations during uh, lecture time, so for example, you tell them to fill it out during lecture time, but personally I also experienced that they would just talk to us and we would just discuss uh, personally with our teacher. and the lecture setting does need to be right for it, so, do, so it does need to be a little bit more of a small 
lecture. You can't do that in a big lecture hall for 300 people. But then um, you get a lot more feedback and then students feel f more free um, to say what they really thought. So it does have to be the right setting. Um, but personally, I also experienced with other students too that that works very well, but then it's not documented digitally. Um, but that's also a good way to gather input. Um, and then you can also, then you actually have a discussion with students and a teacher, so students feel more heard than if they fill out a Google Forms. Thank you. I'm really happy some of these alternatives are coming up already because I do feel that we share a sense of that the way that things are handled now is not helping anyone, not the teachers, not the students, but there, are, um, there is hope. Yeah, I'm going to, towards the last um, uh, statement, which is also more student-centered, and maybe some uh, people in the audience also have an opinion on this. Uh, the omnipresence of data impacts student health, studies, and life. So you don't notice that impacts doesn't necessarily have to be good or bad. So maybe you have some examples of how it affects you, your yeah. life. Oh, definitely. Because if now there's more data and it's also most of it is freely accessible. So um, it's really easy to get caught in this competition, which we started this uh, uh, symposium with. It's really easy to get caught in that and it can affect your well mental health a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but also your studies. Uh, yeah, and just your life in general, because you know, right now if there's more, way more data to compare to. And yeah, you feel like you have to be the best, you have to be better than something, than someone. Yeah. Because right now, if the data, uh, we talked about it with uh, course evaluations, you get this end number, but not the reasoning behind it. And what you see, what you can compare to with other people is the end result, it's the end number. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if you only compare to that end result, you can get caught up in this data, but you don't see the story behind it. And that's really important uh, for me personally, and it's also what we see with like more students. It's really important to focus on what's behind the data. And today, with all these end results being right in your face and having to do more research to get to how did they get there, how did they do that, what's the story behind it, mm -hmm. it's way harder. So it's really easy to get caught up in like a yeah, competition which doesn't say anything but feels like it's super important. So right now that, yeah, I think it's, it mostly negatively um, uh, impacts uh, students' lives. But yeah, it also shows more opportunities to get more data. So that's like the, 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 hind yeah, the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, being from literary studies myself, I really like that you... Uh, the, um, underwrite the importance of stories that is behind the data, as you put it so well. So that we uh, remain very um, conscious of the fact that data are a representation instead of the real thing, because I think it alienates us a little bit if we think of ourselves as data points, and uh, yeah, it causes a lot of harm. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone from the audience who has an example or who wants to weigh in with an experience of how uh, data affected their life as a student or a human? No? Don't be shy. Okay. I can bring you the mic. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I feel like whatever goes wrong, um, it's my fault or our fault. Uh, if something bad happens online, uh, we clicked on the terms and conditions and we didn't read them, so it's our fault. If in personal life, uh, there is so much information available, so we should have taken a mental health course or anything to fix our relationships uh, and so on. So everything, it's easier to say that you should have known. Mm. Oh, very interesting. So like personal responsibilization, you could say. Everything boils down to your own individual responsibility <laughs> because it is out there and you should have read the small letters. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone feel something completely different or uh, want to add to this? Someone here? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a very um, a valuable um, um, analysis because it really touches upon many different domains uh, in life. Huh? So actually the, the, the tech companies that you were talking about, they actually also 
use that. Huh? So just they're just a platform, right? And and you, uh, if you're use Airbnb, for instance, I just provide the, the platform and then it's up to us right, to kind of see if you're doing uh, the right thing. Uh, the same applies to, to banking in a certain extent. Right? When, when back in the days you had an old-fashioned bank robbery, it was the money of the bank that was stolen. But now, right, if your, uh, um, uh, your, your money is now being uh, stolen because uh, you got uh, uh, in a phishing uh, uh, problem, or, then, then you have to prove that you uh, we're very careful with your uh, passwords and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think an important aspect that we maybe not really touched upon during our talks, but that the, the internet, that the networking of all this data and, and making it available to, to a lot of us also makes us all responsible. responsible. And what Raya was saying about uh, the fact that some of these actors have very much, uh, very, way more uh, power over the data uh, but not uh, necessarily take the same responsibility for that data is, I think, really one of the challenges that we face on the individual level. Uh, what you were saying about uh, you have to read uh, the, the terms and conditions or you have to fix your own mental health. Mm -hmm. But also on, on the uh, economic level, on the legal level, mm -hmm. on lots of domains in society, we are facing this problem. So I think it's a very valuable point that you uh, raised. Of course, yeah. Okay, so, so one thing um, that I uh, saw like a few years ago, uh, we introduced a new learning management system, Canvas. Okay, so maybe most of you are familiar with it and use it on, on almost a daily basis. And there was a long discussion we had whether we would open up a feature of Canvas uh, which relates to learning analytics. <coughs> where we would, as a teacher, actually see a lot of uh, the uses uh, on a daily basis, we would get reports, okay, that student is uh, using uh, this document and so on, and then you give an assignment and then you know exactly what's going on. Uh, and then it would be a signaling mechanism uh, to say, well, uh, you need to intervene or you need to do... Uh, there was a lot of discussion also with uh, students uh, about this, uh, and I don't think, unless I missed something, that it's now uh, widely used. I don't think uh, it's opened actually up to... Uh, and again, uh, what I would suggest to do is to start, before you consider this, to more scientifically do a pilot and look at what the effects are and try to understand with a bunch of smart people uh, whether it would have positive, and there are lots of things about positive effects, but there might be things that you did not anticipate, like negative effects, behavioral effects, uh, students get demotivated, uh, you know that you are monitored all the time, it gives you stress, these types of things, and, but you need to do this. And I would not exclude it ex ante, but I would start experimenting and, and of course be very transparent about this when, when you use uh, students as, uh, well, as uh, guinea pigs and yeah. so on. But, uh. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Philip. I think we have to conclude this, uh, this panel session. I want to thank you all so much for your uh, uh, contributions and I think I'm going to give the word back to our presenter of the day, David. Can we get an applause? <laughs>